So in the past three years, it uh, is fair to say that there have been some very important new policy developments, uh, particularly at the central level. Uh, we now have India's uh, first national mental health policy that was launched in 2014. Uh, the district mental health program is being rolled out, I think, approximately in, uh, to about a third of the country's districts, which is more than uh, before. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the problem continues to be in the implementation of the uh, program. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, in more than half of those districts, uh, the program is still to really have any impact on the ground. Um, most of the program is still entirely focused on a very medical model of care in district hospitals and any of the philosophy of community-oriented psychosocial care I do not see happening in almost any district of the country. Another disappointment is that the uh, a mental health care bill that had been drafted by the previous government has still not been passed by parliament. It uh, still remains stuck for reasons I do not understand. Uh, this is a very progressive bill. Uh, and I'm hoping very much that uh, very soon, hopefully in the next session of Parliament, this bill will be finally passed. Actually, you know, I think there is actually much more political will to support mental health than I have ever known in my career. I think the real lacuna now is in technical skill. Uh, that is to say, the technical skill to implement mental health programs. I think the government's approach currently is very um, constrained by the medical model. Uh, I think the same approach that is being used, say for example, for an HIV or a TB program is being applied for mental health. But mental health is a far more complex set of health conditions and I think one has to have the right technical ability and knowledge to implement mental health programs. So unfortunately, even though, for example, the mental health policy or the program I think are very progressive and visionary, um, on the ground, at the level of a district, there is just not sufficient uh, capacity uh, in the district health authorities to implement that program. For me, I think one of the most exciting futures for mental health is to deprofessionalize mental health care, uh, to take mental health directly to the population by creating much more awareness and literacy amongst the general population, by providing tools for ordinary citizens, particularly young people uh, who are very tech savvy to actually uh, uh, take care of their own mental health, especially when they're mentally unwell to use community health workers, such as for example the ASHA worker model, uh, to start providing mental health care alongside the care of other non-communicable diseases. To me this is really the, the most important future uh, for mental health care. To this I'd also like to add um, the need to empower people with mental illness uh, to become very important agents of change uh, for their own well-being, uh, to strengthen the network, just in the same way as we've seen with HIV, uh, to strengthen the network of people affected by mental illness who are able to be more effective advocates as well as more effective peers to support one another. So the, I, I have just recently uh, reviewed the MSF uh, study in Kashmir and the findings are exactly consistent with the sorts of research you see coming from other co conflict affected areas in our neighborhood for example in Afghanistan. Um, the study is largely focused on adults and I think what I'm particularly worried about is the impact of this kind of ongoing conflict on the mental health of children. There is now very good evidence of how uh, stress in childhood, um, such as the stress that you might see due to conflict, has profound impacts on the developing brain of the child and this might potentially explain, for example, increased risk of aggressive behaviours when the child becomes an adult, leading to an intergenerational transmission uh, of violence. Uh, I think I think as a state we need to be deeply concerned about the effect of conflict, uh, not just on adults, I think that's a very important group, but especially on the children of Kashmir. I think conflict is political, but I think politics also engenders conflict. Um, in my mind, the first thing I would do is, and this is not being political at all, this is really being entirely thinking about the well-being uh, of people in Kashmir, is to reduce and even ultimately remove the role of the army on the streets. I think to live in a neighborhood where you see armed men walking around must be stressful for anyone. Imagine if this was Delhi and you had soldiers at every road corner. Imagine how stressful that would be for yourself and for your family. Uh, and then you can imagine how stressful it must be to be a Kashmiri today. 
So there's a lot of talk about the effect of climate change on health and I'll only restrict myself to your question on mental health. Um, clearly one of the gravest threats of climate change is on the livelihood and economic security uh, of large sections of our population that rely on agriculture. And I think we know very well that uh, when economic security is threatened, this profoundly affects mental health. Consider for example the suicide uh, epidemic of farmers in central India. Uh, you can now extrapolate into the future if these sorts of recurrent droughts and climate change related uh, uh, um, agricultural crises um, are extended to wider sections of the country what is the likely impact on for example depression and suicide in the farming and other rural communities is likely to be profound.